Hello there, my name is Dr. Douglas Dillard. I'm the owner, founder, and editor of ChiroGeek.com. Welcome to another video. Today we're going to talk about lumbar disc herniations, and I'm going to try to cover this topic in under 30 minutes, and there is a lot of material here. So I want you to go and review my normal lumbar spine and disc anatomy of video and how to read your MRI video before tackling this page, because I'm going to assume that you know a little bit about those subjects. All right, we have a lot of material to cover, so let's get moving. The best way to get through this material is via PowerPoint, and I have created a PowerPoint just for this video. So now I'm gonna put my head down, and I'm gonna focus on the PowerPoint, and here we go. Now I will talk a little bit about some anatomy. So this is a P to A view, or a coronal view of the skeleton and we're going to zero in on this area right here which is called the lumbar spine. Now there are five lumbar vertebrae that are stacked nice and straightly on top of a base called the sacrum. From the side view which is called a sagittal view we can see that we don't have a straight line anymore. We have a curve and this is called a lordotic curve or a lordotic lumbar curve or a lordosis. And we'll notice that there's the vertebrae, of course. Between every two vertebrae, we have a little padded structure called the intervertebral disc, which is the focus of our discussion today. If we blow that up, we'll see three vertebrae here. And every vertebra, disc, vertebra complex is called a motion segment, and that's the functional unit of the spine. All movement occurs there, bending, twisting, everything occurs at the motion segment. When two bones come together you also form a very important hole called the neural foramen or intervertebral foramen or IVF. There's one on the left and one on the right. Now everything is named in accord with the bone above on a motion segment. So this is the L2 slash 3 motion segment. This is the L2 disc. This is the L2 neural foramen, or the left L2 neural foramen. And this is the L2 exiting nerve root here. Now if we look at you from behind, this is a PA view. We won't go over the facet joints, but real quickly, I guess, there's the facet joints. Again, my anatomy, uh, normal anatomy page will take care of all that. But if we take a saw and saw you in half and we go right through the disc, right through the facets, and then we look down on the trunk of the tree, we have a disc level axial view, which is very important because it shows us the disc. We always look for this in MRI. And now we can see the two parts of the disc. We have a nucleus propulsus here, which is about 80% water in a normal disc. Why? Because the cells of the nucleus put out a product called a proteoglycan. These proteoglycans, they form bigger molecules called agarcans, and those are like little water sponges. They're very hydrophilic. They grab water and hang on to that water for dear life, and that's why the nucleus has such a high water content. So this sloshy mess has to be held in place by strong rings of collagen. And these black rings represent the lamellae of the disc. And collectively, the lamellae make up the annulus fibrosis. The job of the annulus fibrosis, which you can see in dark green here, is to corral tightly the nucleus propulsus and hold it in place. When it does so, we have a beautiful example of a closed hydraulic system. What's a closed hydraulic system? What are you talking about? Well, when we're up and walking around, we have obviously a weight pushing down on us. We have the weight of gravity, we have the weight of our body, we have the weight of our head, and that has to be transmitted through the spine. That's called axial load, that weight that presses upon us. And when water is compressed and it can't escape, it becomes incompressible and forms a beautiful closed hydraulic system. It's almost like a ball bearing at this point. As long as the annulus is intact, let me repeat that, as long as the annulus fibrosis is not ripped or torn, we have a nice hydraulic system. Therefore, all the motion and the pivot point, everything happens in the center of the vertebrae 
and in the center of the nucleus propulsus. That's the way we're designed to work. 20% of the axial load is carried by the facet joints, were, which are like little door stops. They stop extension, they stop rotation. But 80% is transmitted through the center of the disc. Now, let's talk about the nerves a little bit. You can see immediately that the posterior of the disc is infested with these nociceptors. What are nociceptors? They're like pain triggers or pain on off switches, like a light switch. If you flip on the light switch of a nociceptor, it will send an electrical signal down this nerve, right, this little skinny nerve called the sinovertebral nerve that'll get up into the brain and the brain will interpret that signal as pain. So it'll know the pain is coming from the low back. So that's what these do. These are all the way around the disc. I just drew them in here for the purpose of this cartoon. So if these nociceptors get inflamed or compressed or irritated, you're gonna feel low back pain for the most part. You might get a referred pain down your leg. It's called discogenic referred pain. And we'll leave it at that. Go to my website, chirogeek.com, if you wanna learn a lot more about that. Now, what causes sciatica or that radicular pain that burns down the leg? Sciatica is caused when one of these two nerves or both of these two nerves are irritated. This is the exiting nerve root. Again, this is the exiting lumbar nerve root. It always takes, we just learned that it takes on the name of the bone above. The disc takes on the name of the bone above. So this is the L3 disc. This is the L3 exiting nerve root here. This is the L4 traversing nerve root. And you can see that it's still contained within the thecal sac. It hasn't poked out of the sac yet or budded off the sac yet. It will if we went two or three slices below this level, we would see this poke right out and it would then exit the neural foramen, the level below as the L4 exiting root. Kind of get the idea? So typically when these two become inflamed and compressed, that's when we get that sciatica pain, that horrible burning, stinging, numbing, stabbing, electric-like pain that typically runs from the buttock, down the thigh, down the leg, and into the foot. That's real full-blown sciatica. Although some people just have a horrible pain in their calf. Some people have a horrible pain in their thigh or, or just in their foot. Sciatica has many masks. It's very difficult sometimes to diagnose this beast. Okay, enough about the nerves. Now here's our first MRI. This is a L3 axial disc level cut. And now we can see well, of course, now we've learned in the How to Read Your MRI video that this is a what? Is this a T1 or a T2 weighted? Good. This is a T2 weighted MRI because we can see inside the thecal sac here the cerebrospinal fluid. We can also see the nerve roots lining up like airplanes on the tarmac waiting their turn not to take off but to bud off the thecal sac. This would be the L4 traversing root right here. The L3 exiting root is here, that black structure, and here. Now, this is kind of a grainy looking uh, image, but I put this up here because the odds are this is what you're going to see. This was taken on a, a 1.5 Tesla machine. And let me go off on a little tangent here. Look at this image right here. This is another L3 disc. This was taken on a 3 Tesla MRI machine. So, if I was you, and I got a script for an MRI and I, I could go wherever I wanted, I would call around town and find a three Tesla machine, find out who has the latest th uh, T3. And I would go to that center and make sure, of course, that they actually put you in the tube. I've had patients go for a three Tesla MRI and the center had two types of MRI machines and they end up getting a 1.5 Tesla. So make sure you're actually getting in to the three Tesla machine. I would also have your doctor order two millimeter cuts through the disc on the axial view. What are these structures right here? Let's see if you learned anything from the how to read your MRI video. What are these structures? Those are your facet joints. Here's the wishbone 
right? Remember that? Or it looks like a slingshot. That's the posterior arch. This is the back. This is the front up here. The nucleus has a higher water content, so it shows up bright white. And you can see how it's corralled by the annulus. And I put, drew these in if you can't see them to help you out here. Okay, here's another L3. T1 or T2 weighted? Good, this is a T1 weighted because it's black. We lose the cerebral spinal fluid and tissue with high water content turns up black. Now, one more thing I wanted to say about that. Let me back up. Notice that we cannot see any exiting or traversing nerve roots. The exiting nerve roots, of course, are here and here. Where's the traversing nerve roots? They're inside the thecal sac. Actually, you can see them just starting to bud off here and here. So they are starting to poke out a little bit. But for the most part, L1, L2, L3, and about 50-50 at L4, you won't be able to see these uh, the traversing roots budded off yet. But L5 is a strange bird. This is the L5 disc, and you can see the classic Mickey Mouse appearance here. Here's the thecal sac, which is the head of Mickey Mouse. And then you can see the ears of Mickey Mouse. What do you think those are? Good. Those are the traversing S1 nerve roots that have already budded and are well outside of the thecal sac. This budding occurs actually at the posterior body of L5. So so what, doctor? Why are you bugging me about that stuff? What's important about that? Well, look at, they're very exposed and naked out here. They're right next to the posterior edge of the disc. So if you develop a leaking annular tear or if you develop a herniation, they are right in the line of fire. They're going to get compressed and probably irritated. Not always, but uh, that's probably why we have such a high prevalence of lumbar, symptomatic lumbar disc herniations at L4 and L5 because the nerve roots are already out. Now these these roots are protected. Remember there's a motor and a sensory component within this nerve root and it's surrounded by a sheath of dura or a dural sleeve we call that. And it has a little cerebral spinal fluid but not nearly as much as here. There's a lot more cushion plus there's typically a lot more distance between the thecal sac, between the traversing roots that are still in the thecal sac. So uh, that would be a great study if anybody wants to do that study, please contact me. I, I would love to set that up. Now, what are these things out here? Well, if this is L5, those are the exiting L5 roots out there. Those are actually the dorsal root ganglia of L5. Okay. Now, let's talk about the little tutorial here. This is going to be a cartoon presentation of how a disc herniation is born. So. When you look at an axial view, always look at the posterior margin. If the disc is a clock, you can see the disc here, like this football shaped thing, which is degenerated. There's the center of the clock. Always look between 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock and just go down the edge of that disc. There should be nothing sticking out like this. What the heck is that? I'll let you think about that and we'll get back to that. But let's go through this tutorial. So we start with a normal, healthy disc here. You can see the nucleus, you can see the annulus. There's the thecal sac within the central canal, right? The dark gray is the central spinal canal. And you can, you look for these neuroforamen here. And you can see, you won't see the whole L3 root, right? On MRI, you just see a piece of it because it's coming obliquely out of the page, the plane of the page. There's the traversing root. The first step in the birth of a herniation is the disc becomes degenerated. Now, it doesn't always happen like this. You can have trauma and tear the disc and herniate the disc. But typically, the scenario goes like this. The disc degenerates. Why does it degenerate? What does that mean? Now, I have a whole page on that at chirogeek.com, so I'm not going to dig too deep into it. But basically, the cells of the disc start to die and usually that's because of a nutritional problem. Basically, they starve to death because the feeding system of the disc is pretty darn lame. Um, we'll look at that here in a second. But on the MRI, you can see disc degeneration very easily. This is a 25-year-old patient. 
Here's a, uh, this is a sagittal, a mid-sagittal view, and you can see the beautiful white color of a normal disc. Now, this got to be on T2 imaging, right? You can't look at this on T1 imaging. All of these discs will look black. Or will, will look black. So you have to make sure you're looking at a T2 weighted image. But look at these discs. They're black. That's called desiccation. They're dried out. And when discs dry out, they become vulnerable to injury and they can tear. And that's exactly what happened here. These discs ripped all the way through. And this patient now has two small disc herniations.